Hi, my name is Andrew Hufton, and I'm the managing editor of Scientific Data. Um, but today I'm here to represent uh, more widely uh, the Nature Publishing Group and our larger family of journals now in Springer Nature. So I think we've already had some good background. I'm going to sidestep some of the conceptual issues here because I, I think um, what I want to give you is, is a concrete look at some of the steps the Nature Publishing Group has been taking to try to increase the reproducibility of our own publications. Um, and as a bit of background, um, in about 10 years ago or so, there, there was um, a number of publications, uh, or starting 10 years ago, that raised a growing sense of alarm about the reliability and the reproducibility, specifically of the life sciences literature. And as we've heard today, some of these concerns and, and alarms are not new to, to scientific inquiry, but there was, was a, a renewed sense that, that something's wrong with the way that we're publishing specifically life science research. And these are three publications that I think are very um, instructive on this topic. The first one from uh, John Ionides um, addresses specifically some of the statistical concerns that Zoltan talked about in the biological sciences, um, and it, it aligns very closely with what we've discussed. The second two are concerns from the pharmaceutical industry, specifically um, that they were having a hard time building upon published academic publications, that they were not finding our publications a solid foundation with which to progress science. So this is, while again, we don't have a lot of insight into exactly what those companies were doing, there's a lack of transparency there. We do have quantitative knowledge that you know, phase two trials are um, less likely today. Um, to succeed than they used to be, et cetera, and a growing sense that, that pharmaceutical inquiry is being slowed by the lack of re reliability in the literature. And I think we as publishers, uh, we need to uh, take a step back and say, well, what's our role? Our role is hopefully to provide a transparent publication record that provides a solid foundation for others to build upon. And we've already talked about there are some common issues that can undermine this sense of, a tra of transparent literature. And we've already talked about many of these issues today. So just to, to remind you all, these, there's common problems with methods descriptions, um, things like randomization, blinding, sample size. There are common problems in statistical analysis, both in terms of uh, describing clearly what your statistical analysis entailed, but also um, clear problems in terms of overuse of p-values or p-hacking, et cetera. Um, the, within the biological sciences, there are common problems with image manipulation. Again, we're not talking about fraud here. We're just talking about inappropriate um, manipulation of images that, that reduces the ability to someone else, of someone else to get a full picture of the research. And of course, my uh, focus is data access and data deposition because I believe very strongly um, having access to the data underlying research is a key issue underlying the ability of others to reproduce and build upon um, published research. So the Nature Publishing Group and Springer Nature believes that ultimately we need a joint approach between funders, publishers, institutions, and researchers going forward. So in the rest of my slides, I want to give you um, some uh, highlights of the concrete steps that the Nature Publishing Group has been taking to try to increase uh, the transparency of our own publications, and I'll also highlight some of the other things that are going um, on around uh, Springer Nature. So first, methodological details. What can we do to improve the quality of reporting in our own method sections? So the Nature Journals um, and the, the Nature Life Science Journals have um, created a reporting checklist on key statistical and methodological details. It's in use now at Nature and the Nature Life Science Journals. Authors need to fill it out before a manuscript is sent for review and to update it on resubmission. Um, the com completed reporting checklist is available to referees. Um, it's not published, so it's a tool for the editors to ensure that all of this key information is in the manuscript prior to formal publication. And here's just an example of um, one section of this reporting checklist. Um, for example, question two there says describe your inclusion-exclusion criteria. And we're not asking authors to write a whole second paper here. They can just reference the page where this information is. It allows the editor to check very quickly. Is that information there? Um, the original checklist contained 17 different items hitting on both um, experimental methodological details, things like antibodies um, and cell lines, et cetera. And we continue to update 
uh, the checklist to address new concerns in the scientific community. Um, there's new additions added to it recently to um, ask authors to tell us a bit more about any cell lines they might have been used that have been flagged as commonly misidentified or contaminated, for example. Um, this checklist was developed um, in collaboration with the NIH and has been endorsed now by the NIH. And um, a similar reproducibility checklist is also being trialed at various um, BMC journals, including BMC Biology, BMC Neuroscience, Genome Biology, and GigaScience. And so here's just an example of what a figure legend looks like after an editor has used this checklist to make sure that these key date details are there. And ideally, right, you want to see this kind of information in every figure legend, at least in experimental life sciences. We have a statement of replication. We know that this is a representative image. Um, we have a clear definition of N that's also very clear about what N means. Um, we have uh, a reference to actually the full uncropped images, which are stored as supplemental figures. And we have a clear definition of the statistical test. So these are basic details. The checklist is a tool that helps our editors do their job and make sure that our manuscripts are as reproducible as possible. Going a bit beyond basic methods sections, we also want to encourage a culture where scientists can really reuse and rely upon key experimental techniques. And some of this was, was already mentioned. Um, so we have two different publication venues that allow people to publish and share their step-by-step -step protocols in a way that encourages collaborative science and ensures that people get credit for sharing these. And so this is Nature Protocols, which is a peer-reviewed journal uh, for laboratory protocols. Each is a step-by-step -step publication, sort of recipe style. Um, this is, of course, a selective product that's designed to publish protocols that are going to be of um, wide use. In addition to that, we have Protocol Exchange. This is a free platform. Um, anyone can upload their protocol, um, post it, read it. It's not a peer-reviewed product, so it's very easy to use. You can get your protocol online very quickly. There are hundreds of protocols um, um, in Protocol Exchange already, and many of them are directly associated with manuscripts at the Nature Journals. So the last step of this, and, and I think um, Gianluca mentioned this as well. We, um, we're not just talking about papers. We're talking about papers, data, methods, and code. And we have had advances in our policies on all of these. And my real focus is data. Um, and we believe very strongly that access to the data underlying a paper is key for ensuring the transparency of scientific publication. And so it's been a, a fundamental policy at Nature and the Nature Research Journals for, for essentially decades now. Um, that authors are required to make materials, data, code, and associated protocols promptly available to readers without undue qualifications. So this is a long-standing share upon request policy. And we continue to stand by this policy, but there's a growing recognition that share upon request has certain shortcomings. Um, it relies heavily on trust. It makes data very hard to cite and reference, et cetera. So we've been creating some concrete steps that we hope go beyond this sort of fundamental policy. And I think the first thing publishers can do is remove barriers to sharing. We have to recognize that sometimes we are the problem, right? Um, and, and it's a bit disingenuous for us to say we're promoting data sharing if we're also saying, well, you can't do it until you publish with us, for example, right? Um, so the, the nature titles and scientific data now explicitly allow pre-publication of sharing and article preprints, and we say quite clearly that it will not compromise the publication of your article. We also say that publication of data articles without results or analysis will not compromise the novelty of results-based research articles, and there are similar policies in place at the BMC journals. So we, we really think that's step one. Get out of the way. Let people who want to share, share. Secondly, we have solutions now for small data sets. So behind figures, we have ways that, that, that people can either link numeric data directly to a figure or link, for example, full blots um, to a figure. <clears throat> and what this does is that when an author provides this data, it allows someone else to very quickly download it, import it into Excel, and replot, for example, an aspect um, of the, just checking to see if the laser pointer works. Uh, not important. So there, here you can see that they, we've basically replotted the oct um, line that's in panel C, 
there. And so this is very quick. This is a great way to create more transparency and to allow other people to really quickly test perhaps the effect that a statistical choice had on a particular conclusion. So in addition to that, we've strengthened our um, data access uh, policies in many ways. So we now have a clear preference for sharing of large data sets in public repositories. Mm. We enforce data de deposition in fields where there are strong community consensuses. This is not new. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we now have a list of public data re repositories that we recommend, and this is maintained by my journal, Scientific Data, and it's a resource for all of the Nature Publishing Group and for other, others as well. And we encourage authors to publish data descriptors at Scientific Data before, with, or alongside their results paper. And so I want to give you, in the last couple minutes here, a very brief introduction to what a data journal is and the role that we think that they can play within this larger picture of produ promoting reproducibility. So scientific data, um, it's an open access publication for descriptions of valuable data sets. And the key principles are that scientists should get credit for sharing their data. And you know, sharing upon request is not a good credit mechanism. And to a certain degree, dumping into supplemental material is not always great either. Um, the articles themselves are focused on data reuse, so it's helping other people use your data. Uh, the publication, we're fully open access, we've published by default under a CC BY license. Each article is supported by machine-readable CC0 metadata. The articles themselves are rigorously peer-reviewed. We believe that data quality is as important as the reliability of results. And um, I think echoing what we've already said, we believe very strongly that publishers shouldn't be setting up their own walled data gardens. So we work with community data repositories. We have a list of over 80 that we currently recommend. Um, and each article that we publish is then linked to data stored at a community repository. And uh, just to, to highlight, there are two other uh, journals within the BMC family that have a data note article type which shares many of these features. So again, we're creating a variety of venues that allow scientists to share more of their research, um, including data code protocols, et cetera. And so this is an example of one of our publications. This is a, a drought monitoring data set. Um, it was actually one of our first publications. Um, it was a previously unpublished data set, so people are willing to share data through data publications. Um, we stored the data in Figshare. There's an integrated um, data viewer in Figshare, the code is available with the article. And if anyone questioned, you know, will people cite articles that are just about data? Yes, this article has been cited, according to Google Scholar, 37 times. You can see one citation here in uh, a letter at Science. Um, and, and so we can see making data reusable and understandable does promote reuse, people will cite it, people will use it. And I think that's what we're about, is about, you know, us as publishers helping scientists who want to have more transparent publications do the right thing. And so thank you for listening. Um, I'd, I'd like to call out two of my colleagues. I'm, I'm kind of the, the junior member of this panel. Um, Ian um, H. Um, is the head of data at, um, uh, in the Open Research Division of Springer Nature. And Somia is the head of policy for the Nature Publishing Group as well. And so they've contributed to a lot of the content I've uh, presented today.